thing about morning is, there's not so many people up. There's lots of space in it. And the way the light comes pouring in through barn doors is like God calling. You awake yet? Or, if you don't believe in that kind of thing, you could say it's a relay race and the moon gave the sun the baton again. In the morning, dirt smells best. Here, smell this. It's a merge of life and death and mystery. It's the bones of old mixed in. We will become carbon again, certainly. Oh, but we don't talk about this, actually. It's too close to home. Funny what kind of information people skip over. Like how we have this here island with such beautiful soil and the irony is even though there's so much iron in it, it seems to not be enough. So people sticking it with too much, it's rough what we're doing. The earth up to a certain point will be forgiving. But she's not going to feed us if we keep stripping her. We forget we're the fetus and she is the nurturer. She doesn't need us as much as we'll be needing her when the fields are ravaged and the nutrients we want scavenged are limited and scattered. We forget that good food, healthy planet is what we're after. And there's lots of ways to get that. The PEI is little more than a million acres and about half it's agriculture, so we really have a 500,000 acre farm and we're surrounded by water. So we have this, this differentiation just by where we are. Well, farming has been really closely associated with being an islander, I think. For a long time it was rural, people were on the farm. They went to the city, but their home was still back on the farm. Right now, agriculture in PEI is definitely in crisis. Prince Edward Island is not a very easy place to get your product moved off. It's more expensive than other places. So even if commodity farming worked for somebody in the Midwest, it's even harder here. There's a lot of farmers that have been involved in commodity farming for a long time and commodity prices have been steadily going down. Five, ten years from now, people may say, well, geez, I wish I'd known that that was happening. I wish I'd known that, you know, so many farm families were abandoning the farm or no one was there to take it over because the debt loads were so high. We have these food palaces. There's no food crisis as far as people that go into these food palaces are concerned. Nothing that you can see, nothing that you can feel, nothing that you can taste that says there's trouble. Why are you going to worry about it? I'm the fifth generation farming this particular part of the farm. The other side of the farm, I'd be the sixth generation on there. Yeah. Farming here, I think, was basically organic farming, if you will, for the first hundred years or so. And around 1945, around the, the end of the Second World War is when really it started becoming more industrial. So you have bigger and bigger and bigger machinery and bigger and bigger farms. We've been told for the last at least one generation, probably two, that we have to be more efficient, more efficient, more efficient, more efficient. And the only way you can be more efficient is get bigger and produce more of something and do it cheaper. What we used to have was a whole lot of farms in between, little dairy farms, little beef farms, little little mixed farms scattered all over the place between. Well, now if you drive through Freetown, there's basically none. They're all in rotation to potatoes. There's a huge environmental impact to having these big fields of potatoes with all the insecticides in them. And as we go on year after year after year and rotating them around, we, we impact the insects and, and the biodiversity. So we have two very distinct directions we can go. Do we want to get more out of what we're doing or do we want to produce more of something and selling it cheaper? We can either have PEI in 100 years with three or four farms maybe, or do we want to really do something now and preserve the ability to be a family farm? I think going organic can do that.
I've been protesting against what was wrong in the world for a long time, and I felt like I wanted to do something positive instead. I wanted to be part of positive change. Sometimes what people say when they want to discredit organic is to say that they don't want to go back to farming like their grandparents did. That's just not the case. Organic farming has evolved in the same way that chemical farming has. We have many things at our disposal now. Lots of tools and understanding of how pests work and how beneficial insects work that our grandparents didn't have. And it's true that when our grandparents or great-grandparents started using chemicals, their production increased greatly. But that's because they had super healthy soil and they didn't have a lot of pests their production started to decrease after a few years because the health of the soil and the plants was compromised. And so then they started having to use pesticides to control all those imbalances. I grew up on the farm, it's a family farm. It kind of evolved, it was uh, like the, the mixed farm back when my grandfather run it and then dad had a dairy and the conventional potatoes and I was involved in the potato operation and uh, spraying and all that stuff. One day I just decided that there has to be a better way. I'm the fourth generation farmer and uh, it means quite a bit to me to, to be able to farm there and speaking with Dad and, and numerous conversations since we've become organic. Um, some of the practice and stuff that I've learned in college um, of how to farm organically has been the exact same practice that he's done as a child. Look at what we got. Country roads that shine in the eyes of tourists. The meals we make to pass around tables, not only to feed but to nourish. Our ground that flourishes in all seasons, whether resting or yielding. Flowers from seed given pollen to bees that would be grateful to keep toxins from their honey. And children could go running with clean air in their lungs, less dusting to settle on all of our lawns. And the mood on the farm could be communal and calm. Competent women and men keeping on. Be it in the woods, by the highway, your next door neighbor in the city, where plants are still food and animal husbandry means caretaking, means kindness, means some kind of loving. Because what we take inside us should not get there poisoned and struggling. Organic to a lot of people is the growing of crops without. I'm not spraying, I'm not doing this, I'm not doing that, but organic to me is organic with looking after the soil so the soil looks after your crops and then you can feed your livestock and making that whole circle. So when you have a conventional farmer switching to organic but still is of the mindset that they have to control nature, they'll have a great deal of difficulty. We have to understand how to work with nature instead of trying to control nature. And that's the fundamental difference in organic and conventional farming. What they don't take into account is, is the life cycles inside the soil and all, all of the bacteria and fungi and worms and nematodes and everything else that's living inside the soil. They are providing nutrients for the plants. The insect populations or the weed populations all tell you a story of what that soil is going through and you can adjust it to use it in a proper way to, to grow a crop. Organic land will come through a drought a lot better than uh, conventional land because there's so much more water holding capacity in the soil. And once you get that soil health at a, at a viable stage, the organisms in, within the soil kind of combat some of those diseases to look after. We are bringing out some really nice yields on the farm, comparable to conventional agriculture, which, which is good. It would benefit a lot of the conventional farmers as well to be able to change some of their cultural practices to reduce that spray bill. But 
it's just so much easier to go to the store and pick up the jug and put it in the sprayer and spray it and it's done. Somewhat done that they worry about it next year again. Behind the scenes all picturesque are the country's highest rates of cancer and respiratory illness. Pesticides flow from fields to kill off the fishes, and the nitrates in the groundwater are higher than we should live with, and expiry dates on potatoes don't cost as much as the debts farmers are building as they're aging. Without plans to pass the land to future generations, farms forced to expand grow over their neighbors, and community ties are compromised and our stewardship is waning. I've spent many hours in kitchens with farmers with the camera turned off, having, you know, with a beer or two, you know, having talks about this. And believe me, you know, I've had your real hard-ass conventional farmers say, we can't do this forever. There's going to come a point where we'll have to stop doing this. We'll have to find some other way. But my God, you know, I've got three quarters of a million dollars invested in my crop and Cavendish expecting the potatoes and I won't get paid unless they're of such quality and so on. What am I supposed to do? So it's not that they're unaware of the risks, and, and I know some farmers who will say they hate bringing their sprayer out. They hate every moment of it. For most of them, it's not the most enjoyable thing that they do. The people who seriously look at whether we can feed the world or not organically would have to say, well, why have we not been doing a whole lot of research into looking? We've done a huge amount of research into farming with all the chemicals and you know, fertilizers. There's been very little government-sponsored research or industry-sponsored research into farming without. And the reason for it is the companies don't see how they have something they're going to be able to sell. Yeah, if a farmer can produce it on the farm by themselves, how's the company make any money? It's kind of a unique situation in PEI because Cavendish Farms and, and McCain's, McCain's do the same thing, of course. Not only do they buy the potatoes, they supply the fertilizer and the chemicals and the fuel to the farmers. I don't think you're going to see either of them guys switching to wanting to do organic products unless they think that they can sell, you know, organic inputs for just as much money as they can sell their... Because they make, they, they, you know, when they don't make money on their potatoes, they're still making money on their fertilizer. They're still making money on their chemicals. If we had a big corporate structure that farmed all of PEI and that corporate structure collapsed for some reason, which is not unlikely because corporate structures tend to do that, food security would be compromised and is compromised by corporate production. Food security is no small thing. It's the core of our survival. People don't necessarily look at the whole picture when they calculate things. What are all the things that it costs to produce that food? Not just the farmer paying for the pesticides and the fertilizer. What happened after that pesticide and fertilizer got in the water? Who got sick? What animals died? How does that affect everybody? How is that factored in? We have this incredible food system that puts all this stuff into supermarkets at prices that no one's ever heard of, but at what cost, you know, both to the environment and, and to uh, the farmers themselves. And there really are two groups of people. I mean, there are people that, are, uh, that know about farming and how much trouble farmers are in, and there's a lot of lamenting about how difficult things are. And then, you know, there's others that really don't think about it very much. People are busy, uh, life is tough, uh, furnace oil costs a lot of money. You know, it, it, it takes some commitment to think hard about where food is coming from. You know, most people, thankfully, in this modern world that we live in, really don't have to think about it too hard, and they don't. Thank you very much. Okay.
Organic prices are much more just to the farmer. If the cost of your production is reflected in what you make, then you can afford to treat the environment better. Though the harvest is death, giving us life, sunsets for moonrise and long nights, it is also splendid communion, and the sacrifice comes from all sides. The farmers toil, the seeds grow food when we feed the soil. Let us stay as true as nature is wise. On this planet for its people, let us plant something beautiful and reap something equally kind. We've got between six and 7,000 acres that are certified organic. On Prince Edward Island, are in transition to be organic, and we're increasing by 15 or 20 percent per year. So we're getting to the point now where we can actually supply, steady supply of products, nationally, internationally, or locally. I don't necessarily mean I'm waiting for Cavendish Farms or, or Superstore or Sobeys to be the market. I think the only way we can actually do this is if we actually find our own markets, and that's led to me traveling around the world looking for markets. The market has to be there, and I think if the market is there, farmers are entrepreneurial enough that they'll go organic. You know, why, why wouldn't they? It's not all that different. As a consumer, you know, I should have some kind of relationship with the person that's putting food on my table. Cheap food has kind of degraded that relationship. It, 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 it sort of said it, it's not important. PEI is very definable. We're a province of Canada, so we have our own provincial government, which gives us a huge advantage because we can actually make rules and enforce the rules here. Uh, we're, we're surrounded by water, so we have this natural boundary that nobody can dispute. We'd have a huge opportunity to be the only organic island in North America, for sure, um, especially being big enough, I mean, to actually have substantial agriculture. It's totally possible, and there would certainly be benefits to the health of islanders. There would be tourism, there would be more jobs in rural PEI. We would be at the forefront of addressing environmental issues that we all need to address. But there has to be a political component to providing a climate that conventional farmers can transition to organics. It's a complicated, expensive process. All that land that's had chemicals applied to it for the last 50 years is gonna take a while to become healthy organic soil. <laughs> because there's been such a concentration of potatoes and because agriculture is so overlapped with residential, there's a real awareness of how much spraying happens. And so there's a real high level of concern and support for organic agriculture, I think more than on a lot of places. Make it look like the moon very quickly. Yeah. <laughs> and when they're done, there's, there's no cooch, there's nothing, everything's gone. And then when we walk back, I'll show you where the pig pen was last year and we got squashed. In the late 90s, when we were doing the potato breeding and I was going to potato meetings, if you went for a coffee at the coffee, the conversation would stop. People would literally turn their back on you and just walk away. They didn't believe that there was really any merit or any future to organic. It was a fad. It was just going through the roots and berries people or tree huggers and so on. Now when you go in to talk, there's less of the people who've got themselves toned out and there's more of the people asking the right questions. So can we feed the world? Is there opportunity for us to do this, really? PEI has an opportunity still to do something before we've lost all this knowledge, before we've lost all the farmers.
So let's just say we have choices. You know, we can get rid of some chemicals, we can have organic, we can have GMO free. All of these things are on the table. We can do it if we want to do it as farmers. So let's not say we can't. Let's just say we don't want to. That's okay. Say you don't want to, but let's, not, let, let's no longer say we can't do this stuff. We're relatively small. We're, we're 1,500 farmers. So we have the opportunity of working together. Hands dance. Hands plant and seeds grab what they can. Seeking a place to crouch, then kneel, then stand, there are a thousand ways to bend and kiss the land. And we need these plants. They hold nutrients like hope, like smoke. Let it rise and let it go. They are alchemists to chlorophyll, turning it to gold. The planet knows how to breathe, how to keep itself clean. Nature nurtures its babies, its elderly, its matrons, and it doesn't need saving as much as we think. We are the impatient ones, expecting quick, enormous, and cheap. But there will be reason to grieve for one and all. If we can't slow the system's changes, our planet's subtle sadness, let us take, for goodness sakes, a moment's pause. Ain't no change in me. Ain't no change in me. 